Our speaker today is Beryl Dorst. Beryl has been in the Lakeside area um, for 12 years, at, at coming from Arizona, and, and she, she calls Lakeside home for the past three years. She'll share some of her experiences working with mo motivational gurus, Tony Robbins, uh, Fear and the Power, uh, Firewalks, and that kind of thing, and uh, her first book that was a real big hit was called Unlimited Power. Robert Kios Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Marshall Thurber, Create a money and you, and she'll do it in a in an interactive way here today. If you are willing to participate, she has been a dreamer of what's possible since she was a little girl growing up, growing up in a Mennonite community in Ontario, Canada. Always willing to climb, go around, or through another mountain. Beryl, Beryl has had entrepreneurial spirit all of her life. Her definition of entrepreneur can't hold a job and doesn't want to. <laughs> She's offered a, a quick read book commissioned by the uh, Malaysian Minister of Education for student, uh, for business students and a 10-day workshop sponsored by Accelerated Learning Institute of San Diego titled Get, Getting Out From Under and Daring to Live Your Dreams and this is a, a copy of it and you can find it at the uh, LCS library or Diane Pearls. Please welcome Beryl. And if you're going to throw something, she said she requested to make it soft. <laughs> no, no, no. Let me, let me adjust. like I'm going to be preaching to the choir. You know, all you guys have had made life, life choices and big decisions, living outside the box or you wouldn't be in Mexico. So, but Jim has been after me for a long time to do this, so with your participation, let's give it a shot. Okay. First of all, I'd like you to sit comfortably. Are you willing to participate? Let me ask you that. Yes. Yeah. See? Those are my shills. Okay? Um, sit comfortably in your chairs, please. And close your eyes. Take a couple of deep breaths. And go to that soft space, that soft space that you go to when you're... Am I up? Oh. Am I supposed to hurry? Oh, no, not yet. And um, so... Okay, where was I? Go to that soft space, the space that you feel safe. Whenever you're stressed, you go to some place, whether it's on a beach, listening to the ocean waves, in a garden, smelling the flowers, or listening to the birds, wherever that space is for you. Now, imagine that there's a lightning rod extending from the top of your head, going up into the universe, into the vastness of the universe, tapping into the energies of the universe. And there's a soft white light traveling down through that lightning rod, going into your head, down through your face, down through your neck, relaxing your shoulders, down through your arms, through your fingers, healing as it goes, taking away any aches and pains you might have. Now it's going down through your torso, down through your hips, relaxing your thighs, down through your knees, down through your ankles, through your feet, and continuing, taking all the aches and pains with it, down into the core of the earth. Now imagine, if you will, remember a time when you felt totally and completely loved. You knew that you were totally and completely loved. There wasn't any doubt in your mind. And if you can't think of a time right now, make one up. The subconscious doesn't know fact through fiction. So whenever you're, whenever you're, it doesn't know fact through fiction. So make that feeling of being totally and completely loved even more intense. And when you get to an intense point, make a fist 
make a fist and know that any time you make that fist you can have that feeling if you make that fist in exactly the same way you can have that same feeling no matter what's going on in your life maybe it's when you had your firstborn you held your firstborn child in your arms or a small child put his arms around your neck whatever that moment in time is Make that fist even tighter. Make that feeling more intense so that you just have this wonderful, wonderful feeling of warmth and being totally and completely loved. Make that fist even tighter. Whenever you make that fist, you can have that same feeling. Now, whenever you're ready, come back into this wonderful space under this big tree and know that the people around you support and love you. And any time you make that fist in exactly the same way, you will have that feeling. And when you're ready, open your eyes. How do you feel? Thank you for participating. You know, when we're born, we're like this small nucleus of energy. And Whatever situation we're born into, or cho our souls have chosen to come into that situation, there's layers of beliefs and values that are piled on us. And sometimes, we carry those beliefs into adulthood, and we may be running our lives by the rearview mirror, not even being aware. They're not our own beliefs. So when you can consciously make a change, you come into your own beliefs, you come into your own power. So this, these beliefs, then, when we grow, they protect us. They're the people that are feeding us. They protect us. And they say, okay, this is our values, this is our beliefs. Now, as, as, our, um, as the introduction said, I grew up in a Mennonite farming community. Well, who's familiar with Mennonite culture? Anybody? Great. Okay. Well, I'm very proud of my upbringing. It's what's given me my morals, my integrity and my stick to itiveness. So, <laughs> so um, I'm very proud of it. And there's some beliefs that I have changed. I, one of them is that there's, there's very little outward show of affection in the Mennonite community. I didn't grow up with a lot of affection. So I've chosen to change that one. Now, there's also, um, if we keep these beliefs, um, it's not serving us in our adulthood. My grandma used to say, you know, I give grandma a lot of credit. I'm not sure it's justified. But um, grandma used to say, there's three things in the world you should not change. You should not waste people's time, food, and money. I still try to hold on to those. Anytime I leave food on my plate, and I can grab a say, <laughs> But anyway, I, moved, I did all the things that I was supposed to do um, growing up in Ontario. I got fell in love, got married, had two kids. Finally convinced my husband, I wanted to get out of the snow and the cold. So we headed for San Diego. And one of the, one of, one of the childhood memories, let me go back to the childhood for a minute. One of the childhood memories I have is, um, remember those hot, sweltering summer nights? Or any of you from Ontario or the Midwest, you know what those hot, sweltering nights are, right? Well, sometimes my mother used to put a mattress out in the porch roof. And I'd climb out the window and I'd sleep out under the stars. Well, I look up at these stars and I think, oh my God, look at all those stars. Wonder what's out there. Isn't there other planets? Did God only make this one planet? Or did he use us as a model? And is there other people living out there? So I always wondered what was out there. And of course, I'd, I'd Make a wish on shooting stars. How many made wishes on shooting stars? Yeah. Well, now they're probably satellites going together in the arms. Anyway, we moved out of Ontario, went to uh, San Diego, and I finally got a uh, job at the Salk Institute. Who's familiar with Jonah Salk? Yeah. Right. Well, it's kind of an exciting place. Well, I wound up being the administrative assistant to Professor Roger Gehman in the neuroendocrinology lab. First time he told me I had to answer the phone with neuroendocrinology, I said, you're kidding. But 
I got used to it. Well, eventually, I had this nice, cushy job, secretaries, nice pay coming in. The wandering got a hold of me again. I thought, hmm, I can do this. I can open my own business. So I opened my first travel agency, subsequently opened other ones, and then I opened one in Honolulu. Loved Hawaii. So I left that cushy job and went on the line. Now comes peeling the onion part. When you start a business in a new place, you want to get your businesses up, up and going as quickly as possible. Well, I discovered that people in Hawaii were going to this thing called Est, created by Werner Erhard. How many are familiar with Est? You been through the programs? Okay. Well, it's very intensive. I went with a specific goal to get my agency services known and to get their travel business. Well, I got my goal, but I got a whole lot more that I didn't bargain for. I came face to face with how unhappy I was. I knew everything wasn't really right in my personal life, but I didn't realize I was that unhappy. So I made some choices during the week. You have the week between, so I dealt with some of my issues and got to go back the next weekend and have closure on them. So there was a lot of, um, a lot of pain and tears that went into that weekend. Um, you know when you're peeling a real onion, you're going to have some tears, right? Same thing when you're peeling a psychological oven, of onion. And I had a lot of these layers on me, as, as maybe we all did. Anyway, there went some onion layers. When you open yourself up to changes and may not be ones that you really that you really felt you needed to do, there's going to be tears. Well, next, friends of mine in there said, "Well, you know, there's a there's a Marshall Thurber's coming to town, and he has this program, Money and You. That's a pretty catchy title, isn't it? How many know Marshall Thurber or the Money and You program? One." Well, I next attended the Money in Your program. Three days of powerful game playing. And the games that you played simulated what was going on in the business world. In other words, uh, there's sharks and there's shark bait out in the business world. I didn't want to be either one of those. So they taught us how, through these game playings, how to recognize sharks and how not to be shark bait. Very intensive. Well, the Saturday evening, this is a three-day weekend, so the Saturday evening, there's a very powerful, powerful game that is played. And it brings the you into the equation. You come face to face with you. And wherever you are, you take you with you. You are the common denominator in your life. Well, there goes some more onions. It, it opened up my eyes to what was possible, the possibilities in my life. So I made some more choices. When Marshall Thurber, this was invented by Marshall Thurber, when Marshall went on to other activities, it was taken over by D.C. Cordova, the founder of the Accelerated Learning Institute in San Diego. Now, I still do some work with D.C., especially in Malaysia and China. And Robert Kiyosaki. How many know of Robert Kiyosaki? Yeah, rich dad, poor dad. Yeah, yeah, he's a pretty exciting guy. Well, he's also the inventor of a cash flow game. This is a board game that's modeled after the Monopoly game, but it's true to life. It's true to life. The, the people that put this together, these are friends of mine, um, Bob and Rolf. So these are friends of mine that put bi actual businesses and actual real circumstances that we go through in our everyday life. So. It's a very valuable game. He also did cash flow for kids, which should be taught in school, but isn't. And it's, uh, it teaches them that, hey, you can be wealthy. It's OK to be wealthy. You don't have to go um, and be poor all your life. Anyway, very, very powerful. Well, how many know of Tony Robbins? Firewalk experience. OK. Well, his first book, Unlimited Power, is about um, turning fear into power. 
30. Anyway, along comes Tony. Another three-day seminar entitled Fear of the Power. My, my first fire walk was in downtown Honolulu, across from the Aloha Tower. Again, very insightful weekends. Sometimes painful. Layers are not easy to peel off. So you have to be committed to willing and willing to make a change. And finding out what needs to be changed. If you find out what needs to be changed, you can make a choice to change it. Or not. Firewalks are a metaphor for turning fear into power. And I know at least one person here who's done the firewalk. My friend Lori over there. She's even got the t-shirt. Uh, so standing in front of a 15-foot-long, red-hot bed of coals. That can be pretty fearful, right? I mean, how many... If you can do that, what else could you do? I can remember one time uh, a gentleman was, was taking a little longer to get into state, and I'll explain what state is in a minute. He was taking a little longer. The, the plastic on his zipper fused. <laughs> the coals were that hot. Anyway, you get up there, and Tony has prepared you for being in state. You get in front of that firewalk, and he's whispering in your ear, and, and he says, OK, walk. And you do. So you get to the other end. It's a very powerful metaphor. You get to the other end, and you wipe your feet on the wet grass provided and celebrate with the people that are on the other end of the firewalk. I was ultimately asked by Tony and Becky, his wife at the time, to work in the corporate offices in La Jolla. So I did a three-month contract with Tony directly in the corporate offices, bringing in all the logistical offices that we had around the country under one corporate umbrella. So I did that for a three-month contract. I learned a lot about how Tony thinks, how he believes, how the people around him, his team, believes. And we all had one mission statement, to make changes in our lives and in the participants' lives. I've done 23 firewalks myself. I, I'll probably go for 24 at one time. Many, many layers of the onion came off during this particular session. I'm going to turn this, because I don't have a whole lot of time, I was going to do some um, asking for volunteers, but I don't have time to do that, apparently. So I'm going to turn this board around and go over just some of the things that Tony, Tony does. For instance, he teaches about congruency, walking your talk, matching your actions to your values. A lot of times we don't do that. So values versus action. If you want, if you value your family, but you want freedom, ooh, scary. If you value safety and you go skydiving, a little scary. If you want financial security and you buy junk bonds, it's another scary. Honesty. If honesty is one of your values and you're a used car salesman, just kidding, just kidding. Anyway, you get the idea. So once you match your values to your actions, your life becomes a whole lot smoother. It just happens. Instant rapport. You can develop instant rapport with somebody. If you're talking with somebody and you, you model their actions, for instance, you're sitting like this. If I model this, I'm going to get into rapport with you. So it's called mirroring and matching. And if you mirror and match somebody, you can do this across the room, and they aren't even aware of it. Have you ever had somebody come up to you and say, gee, I think I know you. I think it feels like I know you. Well, chances are you subconsciously mirrored and matched their actions from across the room. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now, NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. Neuro being the brain, Linguistic being the language, programming, putting them together. Our words have power. When we use positive words, positive things happen. We use negative words around, you're going to attract the negativity. Now, I personally run from negativity as fast as I can. So I try not to be in any negative situations. 
So when your words have power like that, there's a lot of things that, that, that happen. Your life just becomes a whole lot smoother. This NLP was originally uh, developed by Grinder and Bandler, and it was expanded by Tony. Now, I don't have time to go into it today. This is a whole, this is a whole presentation in itself. So maybe Jim Spivey back there will do a future presentation on NLP. It's worth going to. You learn a lot. Okay, now, being in state. I said I would, I would explain what being in state is. For instance, if a person is depressed, the demeanor is probably eyes down, walking slow, shoulders sunk, right? Does that make sense? So being in state, if you change the physiology, you stand tall, you walk with confidence, your eyes are up, it's impossible to be depressed. So it's something that, that when Tony does the preparation before the fire walk, it's uh, all about getting in state, using your power, feeling confident, walking strong. You walk across the coals in a normal manner. You don't run, you don't stop in the middle, and you don't break state. If you break state, you're bound to get burned. So you're confident. You just walk. And there's a lot of things that can happen in your life when you break through that fear. Anyway, that's about, that, does that make sense to everybody? Okay. We had a, a fire walk in Snowmass, Colorado in the fall of one year. We had an early snowfall. So Tony, had, we'd been in the seminar room and we were going out for the fire, out for the fire walks. We had a 45-foot bed of red-hot coals and two 15-foot beds of red-hot coals. So he's pre pre prepared them to be in state. So they come out, they walk out through the snow. Now it's a full moon. Picture this, it's a full moon. It's glistening on the snow. The music is going. The lights are up. Just having a oh, powerful time. There's people lined up from the guests from the hotel sitting on the small wall around. And they've got their boots and all that on. And they're sitting there watching this. Well, don't you know, some of those got down off the, off the wall, took off their shoes and socks, came up to the head of the line, got into state. This is called spontaneous state. Got into the head of the line. Tony whispered in there, said, walk. And they walked. And they celebrated at the other end. Lots of, lots of wonderful things can happen during this fire walk. Okay, be sure not to run, and be sure to wipe your feet. And then you celebrate. Celebrate, what else could you do? What else could you do be your have? It's a breakthrough of limitations. Okay. The best explanation I've heard for why people don't get burned is that night I was following a father and his son holding hands, and they're walking back to the seminar room. Dad looks back at him and he says, you're awful quiet. What are you thinking about? He says, well, Dad, I think the reason the fire doesn't burn us is we're putting out more energy than the fire. Out of the mouths of babes. I'd like your permission to do one more exercise. Jim, how much time do I have? 20 minutes. I've got 20 minutes? Oh, good. Well, then I'll do another story before we do the exercise. Tony had, um, by imitation only, a, um, a fire walk at where he lived at the Del Mar Castle. Now, this is a beautiful property. So it was a black tie affair. Everybody was in formal attire. And it was culminated by a fire walk. Now, Tony had invited CNN, uh, Fox, and various media people, and people from the magazine. Now, these people came to debunk it. And he knew that. He knew that, but they came, and only, in my recollection, only one of them didn't walk. All of the rest of them walked. So it was a powerful experience for them, too. Um, when you can take somebody that's debunking something and say, no, that's not possible, guess what? It is possible. Lots of things are possible. That's their own belief system that things are not possible. 
All things are possible as long as we're on this side of the ground. Okay. Now I'd like your permission to go into um, a closing, a closing um, exercise. Are you willing? Yes. Who's willing? Yes. Come on. All right. Okay, I'd like you to sit comfortably. <coughs> Close your eyes. I remember a time when you felt totally in control, totally powerful. A moment in time when nothing was impossible. All things were there. You felt totally in control, excited who you are, what you're doing. And if you can't think of a moment, if you can't think of a moment at this time, make one up. Subconscious doesn't know fact from fiction. Just make one up. What would it be like? You feel totally powerful. Totally in control, knowing that anything you touch could not fail. Isn't that a wonderful feeling? Just imagine that. Okay. Now, when you are 100% confident, you're a powerful. Think of that time. Now that you're in that space, in state, stand up. Stand up. Stand up. If you want Mentally, take off your shoes and socks. Remember, you are totally powerful. There's nothing that can stop you. You are totally 100% powerful. You've wrapped your power around you. You are confident. You're walking tall. Your eyes are up. Now, mentally, take off your shoes and socks. Just mentally take off your shoes and socks. And imagine that you're standing in front of a 15-foot bed of red hot coals. And Tony's standing beside you. You've already been through the in-state progress. You're in-state. You're absolutely tall. You're standing tall. You're standing confident. Tony taps you on the shoulder and says, you're ready. Walk. And you do it. You do it. You stroll across those coals. You get to the end, and you wipe your feet really, really good on that wet grass and celebrate. Celebrate with the people that are there to help you, encourage you, to break through your limitations. What a wonderful feeling. What else could you do, be, or have? And the people that were at the other end, they celebrated with you. And you celebrate. You say, yes. You can do it. You are absolutely, you are absolutely in control. And you did it. You absolutely did it. Yes, isn't that great? What else could you do, be, or have? Come back into this. Now, you, now take a seat. You've done the weird and the impossible. Right? You've done it virtually. So there's a lot of things that you can do in your life or your children can do in their lives that they may not have ever thought of. A virtual fire rock experience. Terrific, yeah? Okay, with that, I'd like to thank you for your... How much time do I have, Tim? Like 10 minutes? Holy smokes. Okay, well, hmm. I wanted to leave time for questions. Anyway, with that, I'd like to thank you for, for your participation. And this was actually your presentation. Remember, as long as we're on this side of the grass, we can make different choices. We can do, be, or have anything we want. Have a great day, a super week and a terrific life, and celebrate. Now, before we take questions, and I'm ho hoping there's going to be some that I can answer, before we take questions, I'd like to address something that happened in San Jose, California recently. Tony had a firewalk experience. Um, it was Fear of the Power Seminar. There was 6,000 people at this event. 
I can't imagine the logistical nightmare that must have been. I, I, having been doing the logistics for Tony, I can, oh, I'm glad I wasn't there. Well, apparently there's about 21 people did get burned. They had some degrees of burdens. There was 12 fire walk lanes, 10 foot fire walk lanes. Now, dividing 6,000 people into 12 is 500 people per lane. Now, Tony was not able to be at every one of those, but he had trained people that, was, that were there. Well, I wasn't there, so I don't know what happened, but I can pretty much surmise what happened. Um, people would break state before they got to the end of the firewalk. If you have a doubt in your mind and you're on the coals, you will get burnt. Sure as a kitten's a cat. It's just going to happen. Or if you get to the end of the firewalk, and you don't wipe your feet enough on the wet grass, little coals will stick to the bottom of your feet, and you will get burned. Again, sure as a kitten's a cat. So that is my supposition as to what actually happened. Now, there's only two people, apparently, that needed to, felt they needed to go to the emergency room. Of the 6,000 people, 21 people had some discomfort. What's the percentage in that? I can't even imagine. It's just about zero, 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 zero. I have no idea how much that percentage is, but it's not very many. So if there's only 21 people that broke state, I call that pretty much a success. I just can't imagine 6,000 people. I think the most we ever had was maybe 500, 520, something like that. So I can't imagine what the logistics were like on that. Okay, let's open it up for questions. Do we have any? Wait. Wait. I'm just, I'm just curious. Why? How? Why would I ever want to do a fire walk? You might not. It's your choice. But how? I know. But six thousand people showed up. So mm -hmm. apparently, um, there's some draw to do this. Oh, absolutely. And what is it? Okay, if Paula, if you recognize limitations in your life, and you'd like to make some changes. What a terrific metaphor for doing that. You can absolutely make any changes you like. And I know that's not for you, but, but there's, and it's not for everybody. It's not for everybody. It's for people that actually recognize that they would like to make a change in their life. They would like to have something more in their life. Or they would like to get something out of their life, which I did. So, um, yeah, it's not for everybody, Paula. And, um, I can't recall on any of the firewalks I did, and I did a lot of them when I was working with Tony. I used to set them up. Um, my department set them up for Tony. And uh, I can't imagine having 6,000 people there. But I can't recall of anybody other um, not walking that were in the seminar. I can't imagine them not walking. But it's not for everybody. Does that answer your question? Um, my question is that everything you're speaking of is individual. <laughs> Absolutely. It's I. I. And I have noticed as I have aged, what is most important to me, now that I have made it together, is my relationships. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't matter to me if I knew somebody who didn't basically have their stuff together. I would like them for another reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would like for you to speak on the importance of not just being into ourselves, but being into the whole community. By that I mean everybody. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I will speak to that. The only person that you have control over is yourself. The only person that you can make that you can make a change in is yourself. You can't make a change in anybody else. Now, your relationship to the community, Rosemary, is, is very important. When you are in your own space, and you are powerful in your own, you wrap your power around you, when you are in your own space, people gravitate to you. So you have an influence in all the community around you. Does that answer your question? Does that answer a question for anybody else? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay, great. Back to the fire walking, I sort of answered the question, but I'm wondering out of 
the seminars that you experienced, how many people chose not to try to walk the pool and or got to the front of the line and whoever was vetting the people said, no, you're not ready. Mm -hmm. We've had people like that. We've had people that were not ready. And uh, in Tony's line, he would send them to the back of the line and say, go get into state. Eyes up. Feel powerful. Wrap your power around you. It's a cloak. It's a cocoon. Wrap your power around you. He would send them to the end of the line. And by the time they would get up, if they still weren't ready, he wouldn't let them walk. Pure and simple. There's some people that you have to be really, really willing to make changes in your life. You have to be really, really willing to look at things that are staring you in the face and you might not recognize. So you have to be really willing to do that. Does, does that answer your question? We have another one here. Okay. Uh, two questions. Number one, where did this state originate? Is it from the Hawaiian background? Who? Or where? Tony's state? Yes. Where did it come from? It, it, actually, a long time ago, it came from uh, India and the, and the um, Asian sector. And um, in, some of them, in some of those islands, they do fire walks as a, as a rite of passage. And as a rite of passage. And of course, Tony, being the kind of guy he is, I mean, he grabs life by the... I won't say it, but he grabs life with all that is possible. And he doesn't accept failure. Failure is not an option as far as Tony is concerned. All right. And the second part of my question is, do you think that the state was originated so that we can reach that level of consciousness as we desire? Absolutely. So if you have once reached the state, you can get into it again easier. Easier. Is Much that... easier. Much easier. Thank you've, you've taken out the roadblocks. You've taken out the bumps in, in your life. So when you take out the bumps in your life, it becomes a lot, a lot easier to cruise, right? So once, once you do that, once you can, you can pull yourself into state. Now there's times when I'm down. Okay, I try not to stay around people then. But if, if I'm feeling down, I'll give myself five minutes to have a pity party. And, um, and then lift my eyes. Change my physiology. If you change your physiology, you're guaranteed to change your state. That's just, just the way it is. That's the way we're made. You might want to explain how you use anchoring to, to go back to that state. Okay. Well, the anchoring process that we went through, uh, remember the feeling love, that anchoring process? That's called an anchoring process. When you take a feeling and you uh, put an action to it, you do that action in exactly the same way. That feeling is going to come back to you, no matter what circumstance you're in. If you make that fist in exactly the same way, that feeling of being loved is going to be right there, no matter what's going on in your life. OK, I've asked this before, and I still don't understand. Getting in state, it's got to be more than walking tall and keeping your eyes up. I'm not walking on any hot coals, even if my eyes are up and I'm walking tall. So is it is it a, a hypnosis kind of a thing? It, it's got to be more than standing tall and putting your eyes up. Please help me understand what this in state is. OK. OK. Can, can, I, can I say just one thing about that? Uh, one of the things that Tony does in this pre-talk he does about uh, walking on the coals, he takes about an hour and scares the hell out of you. <laughs> I mean, he, he tells about the people and getting burned and all this kind of stuff and jumping out of planes and getting hurt. He really takes it to a level where you're scared as a dickens, and then he changes it to anchoring you for the state of, of uh, experience you need. Being in state. Lou, we, we, you and I have had this discussion. Um, if you change your physiology, if you stand tall, stand up now, please and stand up tall. Put your eyes up. Put your eyes up. Not, not lifting your head, just putting your eyes up. You've got to feel a certain amount of power. You've got to feel. It, it's impossible. It's impossible not to feel some sort of power. Yeah? You feeling it, Rosemary? Good. 
Yeah, they're great. Smiling. Thank you. You're feeling sad and you smile. Yeah. If you change, if you change whatever is going on in your life, Blue, and change it to something really positive and really confident, and you walk tall and you walk with confidence, you're bound to change. That didn't do it, right? Oh, no, I okay. I can understand the power part, but okay. that doesn't overcome the fear part. Well, Those two things are totally different things for me, and that's what I'm struggling to try and understand. Okay. Um, the fear part. We all have fears. We all have fears. Fears of rejection. Fears of uh, fears of success. Do you know there's many more people that are afraid of success than there are of failure? They believe that they deserve failure, but they don't believe they deserve success. Let me answer this question first, Rosemary. And I'll get right back to you. Um, when you... When you are in state and you're feeling powerful blue, I know you've talked to ton, you've talked to 150 people before, so I know you know what this is. That's being in state, and you can get up there and you can talk in front of these people. I'm in state right now. This is my firewalk. I haven't done this for 25 years, so this is my firewalk. Maybe this is my 24th. What do you think? <laughs> um, I don't know any other way of, of saying it. Was that good? Okay. Does that explain a little bit of voter blue? Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. I, uh, I was just wondering if, uh, if you're in, in this situation in state, the power of positive thinking, of course, is, is not exactly a new idea. Oh, cool. None of this is new. Uh, but anyway, uh, I was just wondering how many people, when they are in state and they go 15 feet, uh, and they're still in state, why don't they go back and keep walking on it for, let's like, say, half an hour or so? Because there's other people behind them. <laughs> uh, that, that's not, that's, that is a cop-out. Well, it's a truth. <laughs> no, that's yeah. a cop-out. I'm okay. asking you, if you're in state, can you keep walking on hot coals uh, as long as you're in state? I don't know. Uh, uh, because, uh, because I've heard some, uh, you know, a physiology, uh, what do you call it? Uh, an explanation of why this can be done. Okay. I mean, it has nothing to do with being in state. It's what, just what? A physics. Okay. A physics. Well, I, 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 it's been years ago, and uh, I, I don't remember exactly, but it has to do with uh, with some development on your skin. You know, and 15 feet is about all you can handle. I am about 45 before. feet. Well, okay, so. Okay. But anyway, I. Uh, but the question is. If you're in state, mm -hmm. how long can you, you know, as long as you're in state, you can walk on top poles. This is mm -hmm. what I hear you say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe that's true. Okay. Yeah. That's your problem. That's my experience. I can only give you my experience. I can't say what's true for you. I can't say what's true for anyone else here. This is only my experience. I'll look it up on the internet. Okay, do it. Do it. <laughs> and if you look it up, look up the San Jose thing. Because they said, uh, there were some people that said, well, you know, the coals aren't really hot. You know, there, there's an ash on them. They're, you, know, they're, you know, all of this stuff. Trust me, they're hot. Uh, that, yeah. Go ahead. Hey, Beryl, thanks a lot. Um, it's me, Claire. Yo, over here. <laughs> Hi. Hi there. Hi. Uh, you know this field fascinates me. Um, comment on the difference between hypnosis brain training and brainwashing and then state. I mean, those are all terms that we attach value in some way to. Okay. Are they synonymous? Is brainwashing the same? No. I mean, I don't know. No. Not in my opinion. That's that's nowhere near. I don't I don't consider myself ever have being brainwashed. I'm not smart enough. So um, I can't see that I have ever been brainwashed. But I know that, that I, I can put myself in state. As I said, this is my 24th firewalk. So um, I, can put, I can put myself in state. Now, I can break state. I can break state, and I can slouch, and I can do all of these things. But if I'm doing something, um, for instance, if I'm in a play, I'm in state when I go on stage. Now, I hadn't done that for 40 years until two years ago, but that was fun. Does that answer your question? No, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think there's any um, simulation between them. I think that, that, that if you're... Hypnosis is one thing. Um, I was hypnotized on a cruise ship recently, 
And even though I knew everything that was, almost everything that was going on, uh, I was still willing to participate. Um, that's hypnosis as far as I'm concerned. The Tony doesn't do hypnosis. It's all up to the individual. It's up to the individual. If you want to go into hypnosis, go. You know, whatever. Whatever is going to get you through the fear. Whatever is going to break through the limitations. Okay, I have one here. Okay. Does that answer your question, Claire? Okay, I'm sorry, that's the best I can do. Are you planning a firewalk workshop? Well, you know, I asked area. Jim whether I could do one here. And he said, hmm, well, I don't think so. I don't think the LCS would go with it, right? Yeah, but that would be, no, I'm not. To answer your question, no, I'm not. Okay, but I do agree. I did go through the firewalk when I lived on the Big Island. Oh, great. And it was quite an experience. It is. I mean, it is. it is. You do get into a state. You do. You have to. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it won't work. Exactly. You're absolutely right. How many here have done a fire walk? Oh, we got all, oh, maybe I can get Tony down here. We got all these people to do it. <laughs> we want to see the movie. Jim. You want to see the movie? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, uh, I think I heard the term love yes. mentioned in these questions and so forth. Yes. Is it possible that love, being in the state of true love and forgiveness, is also the same type of state that Tony does when he creates, when he has a group, as an example? It's um, love is in all of our is in all of our lives. It's the most powerful thing that drives our lives at least in my opinion. And I can only give you my opinion. I can't give you anybody else's. I can't get into anybody else's head. So I can only give you my opinion. Love is a common denominator for the universe. So, um, yes, I think, I think a lot of that has to do um, primarily with loving yourself. When you love yourself, you can pretty much get in a state at any time that you want to. It, and it's a case of, if you don't love yourself, how are you going to love anybody else? You're the closest one to you. You're the common denominator in your life. So the choices you make are your choices. You're the director of your movie. Sometimes you have a horror movie and you get all bad things. Well, okay, you're also the star in that movie. But if you do a happy movie and you want like a Disneyland movie, guess what? You can have that too. You can direct. You can be a star. You are the star. You are in control of your own life. But a lot of people carry old beliefs with them, and that's not possible until they make a conscious choice to change them. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? And here come the rain. Just in time. <laughs> Thank you again. You're welcome. I am um, very interested in the subject of fear. Mm -hmm. We had a speaker here who insisted that we all have fear. I do not have fear. You are a lucky person. And my first grade, and when she went to school, the teacher said, what are you afraid of? And she said, nothing. And the first grade teacher said that was the first child she'd ever heard say that. She was raised by a mother that didn't have fear. Well, my question is, why do people have so much fear? And is it taught? Is yes. it taught? Yes, a lot of it is taught. Like bigotry is taught. Um, when we come into this world, we're just this little nucleus. So we adopt the, the layers of the, of the onion that people put on us, okay? Um, your daughter was a very lucky person to have a mother like you that has no fear. I, can't, I don't know of anybody. I certainly have them. I certainly have them. And I've broken through as many of them as I can. And I'm still a work in progress. I'm still alive, so I'm still a work in progress. So I'm not, you know, I... Um, we have one here. Excuse me? We have another question. Snakes. I'm petrified of snakes. <laughs> you 
put me near a snake and I'm out of there. <laughs> That's absolutely false. That's ab actually, that was taught. That was taught because when I was eight years old, if we have time for a little story, when I was eight years old, um, I was raised in Ontario, Canada, and in the spring, you go out and you go morel hunting. Does anybody know what morels are? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. They're sweet mushroom type things that grow under uh, pine trees and mostly under pine trees. So we were going out, we were, I went out with a family that was next door and uh, eight years old. So I went over this, this rail fence and the rail had rotted, so it tipped over and there was a, a bed of snakes down there. <laughs> I still get them. So um, there was a bed of snakes down there. Well, the man who had been having a couple of beers ran and caught me and held me out over the snake pit while I screamed and screamed and told him totally comatose, totally silent. Finally, his wife came up and said, Roy, you let that child down. And when, but it took me a long time to get in. So I know where my fear comes from. Um, Tony would have cured it, but I never told him. <laughs> Any other questions? Here. Oh, here. Oh, here, okay. You I'm mentioned only. You mentioned earlier about um, a pity party. Yes. I had a, a sister who had stage three of ovarian cancer, and uh, she oh, was. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, a sister who had stage three of ovarian cancer, mm -hmm. and she would every time she came home from the doctor with bad news, mm -hmm. uh, would have what she called a pity party, mm -hmm. and she would turn the timer on for 20 minutes. And she'd have her pity party. I was never there. I, you know, that was her time alone. But by God, when that timer went off, I guess she would say she was in state mm -hmm. because yeah, life went on for her. And mm -hmm. you know, she was one of these people that enjoyed life, loved it, did lived it to the fullest. Yeah. And, well, I mean, more than lived to the fullest. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I would, I guess, I would call that in state when the timer went off. She was ready to go again. Yeah. Exactly. What what a fortunate sister you had, and how fortunate you were to be with us. Anything else? Just get here with oh, mine. Okay. Wait. Hold it this close. What I have to question. Yeah, hold it closer. What I have to question is that, like in hold Scientology, Ron Hubbard was the leader of Scientology. Right. So if this Tony disappears or dies or whatever, someday he will. So. I know Scientology was kind of all mixed up right now. So what happened to your group? Oh, it's still going. It's still going. It's Tony's still, still going. But it, Tony is still going. Fear and the power. I know, I know he is, but what happens when he, disappears, when he dies? Or Well, let's see. Let me look in my crystal ball. <laughs> I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what's going to happen now. I'm sorry. Uh, but Oh, there's other followers that are coming up. There's followers that he's trained that uh, to do this. How long it's going to go on, I don't know. It'll probably go on beyond my lifetime, because I'm kind of an old broad now. But um, it's it'll probably go on beyond my lifetime. When you can get 6,000 people in one cotton-picking place and convince them that they should walk at 500 people per line, can you just can you visualize it? I can't visualize it. I can just imagine what uh, what a nightmare that must have been. I'm glad I wasn't there. What a celebration. What a celebration. You're right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. What a celebration. Yes. 6,000 people at 500. You could I? Nice. Nice walk. We, we, have, we have time for one more question. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Peter. Do you feel that American politicians should do a far walk? <laughs> <laughs> I feel they should get burnt. Break the state in the middle of it. Every cotton picking one of them. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> yes, I do. I think they should. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for participating. I thank you, Your Honor, for your participation. Thank you very much. You're welcome.